The ceremonies of Palm Sunday may be considered in three stages. First, the blessing of palms, which teaches about the good things that come up from the earth. Second, the procession, which teaches about the good things that happen in heaven. And third, Holy Mass, which is what joins these two, the good cross that stood upon the earth and opened the way to heaven. This is the meaning of the palm and olive branches which are blessed and carried, the wood which carries life in it to bear foliage and flowers and fruit. Therefore it is so fitting that the Mass include the long reading of St. Matthew's Passion. Palm Sunday is also known as Hosanna Sunday, from the Hosannas which are sung in the procession, and also as Pascha Floridum, from the word Floridus meaning budding or blooming or flowery, because on Palm Sunday the Pascha or Easter is already in bud, about to unfold and bloom. For the first of these three stages, the blessing of palms is so high in status that one might imagine the holy sacrifice of the Mass has begun. For there is a collect, an epistle, a gradual, a gospel, and preface. But after the sanctus comes not the canon of the Mass, but the blessing of palms, which indicates the very high regard the Church has for this blessing. Indeed, the dignity of matter is attested throughout the whole year. There are specific feast days for the blessings of water, salt, homes, candles, ashes, palms, bread and wine, fields, and first fruits. Of course, the spirit is good, God is spirit, but God loves matter, he loves his creation, and he's pleased to bless it. The Palm Sunday ceremony, as we have it in the pre-55 rites, is at least 1,500 years old. If we go to the Divinum Officium website, we click on Ordo, and select April, and this year, April the 10th, is Palm Sunday, and select the Mass. It begins with the blessing of palms, and there is a reading from the book of Exodus. The children of Israel came into Elim, where there were twelve fountains of water and seventy palm trees. The water and the trees signify life, and in the desert, if one sees trees, one knows there is water there. It is a difference between life and death. For Christians, this life signified by water is grace. And in Psalm 1, we hear about the tree by the waters which flourishes. So our soul is to draw in grace and putting forth its roots and putting forth its branches. If we are connected with God's grace, we will also bring forth fruit. This account of the children of Israel camping by the 12 fountains of waters and 70 palm trees comes in the book of Exodus. And just beforehand, we read of the bitter waters at Marah, which the Hebrews couldn't drink, and they murmured against Moses. But he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, they were turned into sweetness. This tree is a figure of the cross, which turns earthly life from bitterness into sweetness. So then the children of Israel, coming to twelve fountains of water and seventy palm trees, follows on from that. The twelve signifies the apostles, and the seventy all the nations of the world, because the apostles, drawing on this sweet water, this supernatural life, bring it to the whole world, to all nations, signified by the number seventy, and through the cross, signified by the wood of the palm trees. The general meaning of a tree is that which supports life. Think of all the goods we get from a tree. There are fruits for eating, wood for building houses, making tools and weapons fuel for fire, and not least, shade from the tree, which means a lot when the sun is beating on your head. I was once sitting in the jungle, eating bamboo soup with a bamboo spoon, from a bamboo bowl, on a bamboo stool, at a bamboo table, on a bamboo mat, in a bamboo hut, and thought, where would we be here without bamboo? Truly, it does so much to support life. How much more than the wood of the cross? The branches which we carry in procession signify our willing participation in the cross, as a branch participates in the tree. Of the long blessing of the palms, the third prayer tells us that the branches of palms, therefore, represent his triumphs over the prince of death, and the branches of olive proclaim the coming of a spiritual unction, that is, the Holy Spirit. We should be aware of this as we carry the palms in the procession. And the next prayer tells us, as the dove, this is referring to Noah's ark, carrying the olive branch, signified peace coming to the earth. So these branches we carry in the Palm Sunday procession promise that supernatural peace.
that peace of the Holy Spirit that profits all thy people unto salvation. We go back to the Graduale and we see there the reason given for Jesus being killed. The chief priests and Pharisees could not bear to leave Jesus be, for his miracles were drawing huge crowds of followers. In a similar way, those who are trying to crush tradition know that if they would simply let it be, then all Catholics would find their way to it. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the council opined his success would mean the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. This may be a prophetic allusion to the Catholic Church fulfilling the temple and the chosen people with Holy Mass and the baptized. That is, the temple is our place, Hotopos or the Hamokom, the place of worship. And since Christ, we have Holy Mass for that place to be in the presence of God. And God's people have blossomed through the tree of the crucifix so that now God's people cover the whole face of the earth. This reason that was given for wanting Jesus gone and taken out of the way speaks to us today. Churches were closed under corona restrictions, not because sensible men feared a virus, but because weak men feared that if they did not comply, the state would punish them, even take away churches. Where is the faith? The state should be resisted and put back in its box when it tries to interfere with the sacraments and the worship of God. Fearing that our place and our people would be taken away by the state, the hierarchy largely chose to do away with Christ. This is one of the most appalling things that's happened in 2,000 year history of the church. It's not realism. It's not prudence. Realism is to look at the power of God. Prudence is to put his kingdom first and everything else follows. In the Gospel before the blessing, St. Matthew gives us Jesus' instructions, You shall find an ass tied and a colt with her, loose them and bring them to me. Thy king comes to thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the fall of her that is used to the yoke. The church fathers tell us that these two animals signify the Jews and the Gentiles. The ass that is used to the yoke means the Jews who have the yoke of the law, and the colt has not yet been ridden. That means, has not yet been dominated by God. And whereas Saints Mark, Luke and John all tell us in their Gospels that Jesus rode on the colt, Saint Matthew tells us that Jesus rode upon them. We could imagine first he rode on the ass, and perhaps when it was tired, he transferred to the colt. And so the Old Testament served to bring Jesus close to Jerusalem, and then he rode in triumph upon the colt, which is the Gentiles, all the people of the world. And then the last prayer we hear before the distribution of the palms begins connects the spreading of garments and palm branches that we may prepare for him the way of faith from which the stone of offence and rock of scandal being removed our works may flourish before thee with branches of justice. Branches and garments represent here the virtues and good works and these cover over the stones where Jesus will proceed. He should have this glorious way made for him by our faith and our works, stones represent dead hearts, but the palms and branches represent living hearts and the garments, the clothing in grace and virtue, by which we prepare a way for the King of glory to return, to come back to Jerusalem, to the whole world. All our acts of faith and charity prepare for that, for Jesus' return. He's going to come anyway, but we want to make it glorious for him, singing Hosanna. Not so that he comes to a world which is just barren, dead stones, cold hearts, graceless. The distribution of palms before the procession begins with the chanting of Pueri Hebraorum, the Hebrew children. This fits well with the reading we had at the beginning, where we were told of the children of Israel coming to those fountains of water and the 70 palm trees and fits with God's revelation through the Son as our Father. How many great processions there are through the Church's year, the Rogation Days, May processions in honor of Our Lady, and with all possible solemnity, Corpus Christi. But in religious and clerical communities, there are processions every week, at Vespers, and indeed, all Masses. These processions in general signify the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father and Son through all eternity. And then, through the communion of saints, the Holy Ghost, who brings up saints to heaven, so there's an endless processions of apostles and martyrs, of confessors and virgins. Those at the front must know where they're going. Everyone else can simply follow. 
And when the procession goes on and on and on, it's the most glorious to think what a variety and multitude that comes from the absolute simple unity of the Holy Ghost. Dom Goranger, writing about the ceremonies which took place in Jerusalem, tells us the whole community of Franciscans, to whose keeping the holy places are entrusted, went in the morning to Bethphage, there the Father Guardian of the Holy Land, being vested in pontifical robes, mounted on an ass, on which garments were laid, accompanied by the friars and the Catholics of Jerusalem, all holding palms in their hands, he entered the city and alighted at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Mass was celebrated with all possible solemnity. This beautiful ceremony, which dated from the period of the Latin Kingdom in Jerusalem, has been forbidden now for almost 200 years by the Turkish authorities of the city. Thanks be to God, since he wrote that, these processions have resumed, if not quite with the splendour of the Middle Ages. It must have been a magnificent sight. And so the antiphon for the procession is triumphant. Gloria. Glory, praise and honour to Thee, O King Christ the Redeemer. The children were happy to pour out their sweet and glad song Hosanna. Hail King of Israel, David son of royal fame, who comes in the name of the Lord, O blessed King. With palms the Jews went forth to meet Thee. We greet Thee now with prayers and hymns. Or well, the waving of the palms, shaking their leaves, signifies this joy of hymns and the sweet Hosanna's song. Hosanna originally means a plea for salvation. I pray, save. In the New Testament, it comes to mean a confident rejoicing in the one who saves. Not every Palm Sunday procession is going to appear so glorious as that which happened for hundreds of years in Jerusalem or in our bigger cities now. But when you think of all the processions around the world combined into one, for heaven looks down and sees all these souls who are honouring him in their local parish church and not just this year's processions, but all the processions of the past 2,000 years are joined into one song of praise of Hosanna, of confident rejoicing in the Saviour. To celebrate the Lord who in meekness rode on a donkey, no merely earthly monarch ever dreamed of an empire which has spread and endured and raised a culture like Jesus' kingdom. What worldly empire ever covered the whole face of the earth or lasted 2,000 years. Nothing even comes close and the culture which our Lord has raised up of philosophy and music and architecture and sacred art and the goodness in our charity toward one another and in political order and in social relations. There never was a king or emperor who comes close to Jesus. Truly he is God who achieved this by dying on the cross. The palms also signify martyrdom. On the feast of St. Dorothea, we pray, Duplicatum virginitatis et martyrii palmam accepit. St. Dorothea received the double palm of virginity and martyrdom. The palm signifies this perfect witness to Christ through consecrated virginity and through giving one's life. Because both of those look to the next world. What's the point of being a virgin or being celibate if this world is all there is? But religious and priests give this up to point to the next world, the children of God who live for eternity in his kingdom. And the martyr who gives his life does it in great joy and hope and confidence of eternal life. And there is a wonderful ceremony at the end of the procession in the pre-1955 rites, where part of this scholar, the choir, are inside the church singing and part of the choir outside with the people echoing and responding to their chant. So the choir within the church represents the angels in heaven and the choir outside represents the church echoing them in honouring Jesus. The subdeacon of the procession who's been at the front carrying the cross is instructed to use the cross to strike the door of the church several times and when this is done the doors are opened and the whole procession can pour in. This signifies that with his cross which nothing can resist Jesus opens the gates of heaven, and then the church triumphant and the church militant are united. Thus the earthly Jerusalem shadows the heavenly. We then come to the Mass of Palm Sunday. In contrast with the procession which was full of joy, the texts and chant of the Mass will have a somber tone. We remember Pascha Floridum, 
the budding of the passion that will come. This is the approach to the crucifixion. The tract is Psalm 21. My God, my God, look upon me. Why have you forsaken me? So much has been said about this desolation. If only we would read to the end of the psalm, as Jesus certainly prayed the whole psalm on the cross. It says, You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, give glory to him. There shall be declared to the Lord a generation to come, and the heavens shall show forth his justice to a people that shall be born, which the Lord has made. This generation to come is a spiritual generation, a people that shall be born, that birth is baptism, a people made by the Lord, not simply created by God at the beginning of time or assigned their countries and borders through the sons of Noah, but a people the Lord has made, the Lord who became incarnate. He is the one whom God exalted and bestowed a name that is above every name. And here in the reading, the priest genuflects and everybody with him at the name of Jesus. The Lord who became incarnate, who came down to earth to make in people for God a generation to come. Then comes the reading of the Passion from the Gospel of St. Matthew. As you can see, it is a long reading. Whether recited or sung, it can easily take 25 minutes. We shouldn't begrudge this to the Lord who had such a long Passion. No candles are used to accompany its chanting. For the Passion itself, there is no incense, no Dominus Fobiscum. It's sorrowful. Its tone is grave and sad. Even so, during this long reading of the Passion, the faithful hold their palm branches aloft to show the expectation of victory. We read of Jesus being in Bethania and the woman with the urn of precious ointment, a sign of his coming death. Woe to that man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Judas asked, Is it I, Rabbi? And Jesus replied, You have said it. We have the Last Supper. This is my body. Gethsemane. The kiss of Judas, dear Peter's triple denial of the Lord, and is going outside and weeping bitterly. The people's cry for Barabbas to be freed, his name means son of the Father, instead of Jesus, son of God the Father. And those words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when our Lord cries out in a loud voice, and gives up his spirit. There is a pause in the singing of the Passion, and all kneel. If there's ever a moment when tears might come to your eyes in the liturgy, this is one of them. And the women come with Joseph of Arimathea and take Jesus' body from the cross and wrap it in the shroud. After the reading of the Passion comes the Gospel of the Mass. Although there are still no candles to accompany this Gospel, the deacon comes and incense is laid on the coals, he asked for the blessing as before each gospel, that he might worthily announce the Evangelium. And the gospel has its own beautiful tone. It speaks of the chief priests and Pharisees going to Pilate, remembering Jesus said he would rise from the dead, and Pilate therefore giving them permission to set a guard around the tomb and to seal the stone. The communion prayer of this Mass is taken from Gethsemane. Father, if this cup cannot pass away unless I drink it, Thy will be done. And also in the first section of the gospel that was read before the blessing of the palms is preceded by a graduale, which again gives us Jesus' words, Father, if it may be, let this chalice pass from me, but thy will be done. Following the passion and the creed, we have the offertory of the mass. Insult has broken my heart, and I am weak. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, and I found none. We can comfort Jesus today by coming to Holy Mass and remembering what he's done for us and loving him for it. It may be very hard to find the pre-55 rites. It may be hard to find any traditional Holy Week. But whatever ceremonies we can attend, let's give our whole heart to Jesus to console him who was on the cross. The 2,000 year difference doesn't matter. If we're there in the Mass remembering him and loving him, we are there on Calvary. We are there in Gethsemane with him. Please, please come to Mass and do this. Don't let our Lord be looking at the world in the year 2022, saying, I looked for sympathy, but there was none for comforters, and I found none. Let there be hundreds of millions who go and offer him a whole heart. It's a scandal if he had to die so forsaken that we allow that ever to happen again, that he should be forsaken on this world. This is the greatest thing you can do in the year. 
is to attend the Holy Week ceremonies and comfort the Lord with our confidence in him, with our saying, thank you that you went through all this. Thank you that you rode into Jerusalem knowing it was to your death. And you went through Gethsemane and up Calvary and died there so that we could be forgiven our sins and come to the Father in heaven. Of course, we can have these thoughts every day, every Sunday Mass, but the Holy Week ceremonies bring them out of us like nothing else can to share in this prayer as a community. Why does this matter? Even if you're going to go to a 1962 celebration of Palm Sunday or a Novus Ordo celebration, it's important that we study the pre-1955 rites, prepare ourselves in the days beforehand by reading them, praying them, trying to understand them. Let us look at what has been taken away, begin to understand how good it is, and beg God to restore it to us. Otherwise, we're clinging on to the faith by our fingertips, and the enemy is trying to draw it away. If over a billion Catholics were celebrating these pre-55 rites, it would be very hard to draw the Lord out of our heart. God bless you all.